everybody. It's quarter after three. I'm talking till 4.30. My name is Mark Manassi. Um, I appreciate you coming there because I've been talking at TechEds for a long time. And one of the things is that the competition has gotten better and better. And what is that timer doing? The timer in the back. We're going to 60 seconds. Oh, forget about it. Anyway, so, um, so I really appreciate this. Some other great talks I know that I'm up against, and I will try not to waste your time. Let me tell you what this talk is all about. Come on. You can do it. There we are. I somehow put this in presenter mode, and it's doing something weird here. No, I guess it's okay. I guess we're okay. All right. Anyway, I, I like operating systems. Uh, I, I have no life. This is what I do. You know, one of my best friends is Rusinovich, and we get together for dinner now and then, knock off a few bottles of wine, and talk about buffer sizes. It's sad, but you know, this <laughs> this stuff makes us happy. You know, and um, and so when a new operating system comes out. Um, there are certainly, I have, I, I, let me just, let's talk about the elephant in the room, okay? Um, I realize that some of you have strongly held feelings about Windows 8. Did I say that gently enough? I'm not really here to talk about that, because what I'm here to talk to you about is this, is that because operating systems of all kinds fascinate me, I like to see the new knobs and the doodads and all those kinds of goodies. And because some of you are going to make the decision to go to Windows 8, some of you are going to make the decision to wait till Windows 9 or wait for 8.1, whatever. You're going to make those decisions based on what makes sense to you in your organization. And you know better than I do, OK? Um, here's the easy one. How many of you are still on XP? <laughs> I, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I'm not laughing at anybody. I'm not laughing at anybody. And I don't make predictions anymore either, because about 12 years ago, I was doing a keynote. XP had come out. I was doing a keynote at a big show, and no one remembers this. But everybody was pissed off about XP because when you clicked XP, the start menu kept getting bigger. If you compare the size of it in Windows 95, 98, uh, Windows 2000, slash NT4, and XP, XP had this like big thing. It just popped up. And I made this dumb joke that in about 10 years, we're going to need a whole new screen for the start menu. Then in, then in 2011, they came out with Office 365. I was talking at some conference, it's being a smart ass because it's 2011. I said, well, next year in 2012, I wonder if it'll work on February 29th. <laughs> you do know what happened to Azure on that day, right? I got some calls from Microsoft's guy saying, this is your fault. I, said, I just predicted it. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. So I'm not making any more predictions. Well, now wait a minute. I got one more, OK? I think I know what's going to happen in April of 2014. Like in April 2014, Microsoft is going to announce extended support for XP for another five years. That's what I think. <laughs> Actually, maybe not. Maybe not, because I mean, they have had an uphill battle getting you guys to get off XP. That's their problem, right? It's XP is a pretty gosh darn good operating system. XP in 2003, if we, if we never upgraded, the world will, would keep turning. We wouldn't have you know, the cool new features, but you know. And so some of you said you're still on XP. If you're on XP, let me make a small plea to you to upgrade. And here, here's the reason why. I do a lot of security stuff. There's a lot of security shows here. Marcus is talking, and uh, Paul is talking, and whatever. And I haven't been at their sessions because I've been busy. But I imagine part of the story of what they're saying is the threats are getting worse. XP is a great operating system, but it was built in the 20th century. It was largely designed in the 20th century. I don't have to tell you the 21st century threats are a lot different. That's why I was a big fan of Vista. Yes, you heard there was somebody that liked Vista. That was me, OK? <laughs> but I was right. Tell me, tell, me, tell me 20 things you like about Windows 7. I'll bet you 16 of them came in, came in Vista. But um, I mean, if you're, if you're still in an XP world, you're fighting an almost impossible battle in terms of security. Get a 21st century operating system. Go to 7, go to 8, you know, whatever, OK? But what I want to do here is that I, oh boy. See, I have the wrong screen going up there. I apologize. Something must have happened in terms of No? Is that it? All right, good. Good, 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 good. I think that's right. Oh, good, thank you. What I'm going to talk to you about are, are some things that I found that are really interesting. Because I know, you're looking at the new operating system, it's going to be at 8.1, and whenever you hear that there's a really fast upgrade, a really quick upgrade, you know something's up. You know it's going to be one of two conversations. It's either I'm sorry, honey, I, 
I didn't mean it and I shouldn't have done it and I'll never do it again. <laughs> or it was, I did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> so I don't know which one it is. It can be up to you to check. These are some things that in squeezing the juice out of, it, of, of Windows 8, I think I found some neat stuff. I want to tell you about this neat stuff again, because my point of view is if you decide to go with Windows 8, then you should understand that the tablet stuff is totally cool. Absolutely. And if you want a good solid reason to go to Windows 8, the best one I know of is if you want a domain joined tablet. I love my iPad, but it drives me crazy that I can't put it on my domain, you know. But for if, if, if you, if you do, excuse me, if or when you upgrade, when you make that decision, here's some of the goodies, okay? First of all, let me tell you about my experience with Windows 8. Um, I'm largely a server guy. I, I do Windows 8 desktop support. You know, I do I write about that stuff. I consult about that stuff. But I also do server stuff. I think I'm a little better known for server, although I do a lot of books on, on uh, desktop as well. And Server 2012, fantastic. I mean, just really, really great, fun new stuff. I looked at Windows 8 and I said, this is a great first step. I don't, you know, and it's going to be great on touch devices. I didn't really think it was going to be a great idea on a machine that didn't have touch, though, right? Because, you know, when you're messing around with it, certainly during the beta, then there was this sort of thing about in order to get to the start screen, you had to do this thing where you kind of brought the mouse down over here, and it's got to be in just the right place, and then eventually, oh, but it doesn't do it if there's something in the foreground. And it's just, you know. So, but then October 26 happened. Windows 8 day happened. And Microsoft had this deal. It was like, I don't know, 26 bucks or something. You could download... Uh, you give them 26 bucks, and you, they download some bits that would go on your Windows 7 box, and it would do an in-place upgrade on your 7, Windows 7 box without losing any of your data, any of your applications, or whatever. It's like, I thought, the people, my people, the people reading my stuff, they're going to do this. I should have their experience. So while Sanofsky's doing his keynote, you know, over the web, I gave him by 26 bucks that sent me to this web page that showed me how great Windows 8 was. You ever seen these things? We have this every version of Windows, every version of software. There's a whole bunch of really attractive, smiling, happy people with their hands on their computers. <laughs> Do you know why? Do you know why they're happy? They're models. They're beautiful people. People get out of the way for them. And they don't use computers. You know, so. <laughs> if you looked at the web page, it was great, too, because it showed you all the things you could do with Windows 8 that was wonderful. Because um, we had Dad in the easy chair, you know, in front of the TV doing something, fantasy football or something. And Junior was working on her homework, and she had a computer, too. I guess it was a Windows 8 computer. And in the kitchen, Mom had a Windows 8 computer you know, with recipes or something like that. And, um, and the amazing thing was that Dad's black, Mom's white, and the kid's Asian. So Windows 8 can modify DNA. <laughs> it's just, it's, so. so I was excited about this. Because I've been living with this DNA for 55 years, so I was thinking, maybe it could help me, you know? <laughs> so I did the download, and the wizard comes up, and the wizard says, uh, how do you want to do this? And there are three options. One radio button says, blow away your data, blow away your um, settings, and we'll build it from scratch. The second one says, uh, don't blow away your data, keep, keep your data and your settings, but blow everything else away. And the third one was, do the in-place upgrade, don't touch anything. Now, the radio button that was on by default was the blow everything away one. So if I had not been paying attention, this would be a different story. <laughs> so now, I did not back up my data, by the way, because I thought, I know users. They wouldn't do that either. So I wanted the full experience. I know what you're thinking. Do they clank when he walks? Well, I'm telling you, my friends. <laughs> I'm telling you, my friends. That install was awesome. Also, because it was, it was Windows Day, I had ordered a Surface really early on. So I had my Surface, and I'm playing with the Surface, and I was kind of blogging about it as I was doing it, because it was really cool. I mean, here was a tablet. This is awesome. Here was a tablet. And I was thinking a tablet. I thought a Surface would only have the big uh, tablet-y applications. I didn't realize I had a desktop. I said, a desktop, that's interesting. I wonder if there's a command prompt. Because, you know, I love my iPad. But when networking's not working, I'm an idiot. I got no tools. You'd think with a name like iPconfig, it'd be an Apple tool. <laughs> but they don't have anything like that on the iPad. So I'm like, oh, wait a minute, Surface? I got, I, I'm like, iPconfig, I have iPconfig? I love my tablet already. But then I thought, let's get a little crazy here, and I typed PowerShell. And it came back, PS. <laughs> I'm like, I, 
I, I, I have I, 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 PowerShell on tablet? So then I did get dash command dot count. 889. 889 PowerShell command on a tablet? Yes! I would have married the thing if it had been legal in Virginia. And it would have been, but it wasn't 13. So, you know. Just, just, <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. You're just encouraging me. So, <laughs> now, I, I was a little surprised going around and talking to you. I was expecting people who had, uh, that I, I, I expected that most of you had spent some time with Windows 8. That is apparently not the case for some of you, and that's fine. So let me, let me give you a way to think about it. If you're a Windows professional and it's your job to support Windows, think of Windows 8 like this. It's kind of like, it's, it's sort of like a formula. There's the new tablet stuff. That's important but it's totally alien and new. That's the really new stuff, and that's what's going to propel you know, whatever tablets and windows turn out to be, ultimately. But that's not all there is, okay? There's, there's also, as you've seen, and this is the part everybody knows, the start screen changes. We're not gonna talk about that, you know about that. But the third thing is what I think of as Windows 7.5. Forget the start screen stuff, forget the start button stuff, forget the tablet stuff. Maybe your job is to deliver a great operating system that supports all of those desktop applications that have been being built in the Windows world for the last 20 plus years. You're looking for something like Windows 7. You will find that Windows 8, what I call Windows 7.5, is essentially Windows 7 with a bunch of great security stuff built in, tons of cool PowerShell commandlets and things like that. So a lot of what I'm gonna do is I'm mostly gonna talk to you about Windows 7.5, okay? So that's, that's, that's my plan. So the first thing that I came up against, now, so I had this big battleship of a laptop. It's a Lenovo W510E uh, or something like W, and it's got uh, two hard drives in it. I can run lots of VMware, virtual machines. I just love the thing. It's, it doesn't have touch, of course. It's not going to be touch on a screen that size for a while, at least not that I could afford. And so I had to work my way around. And I, I had Carpal Tunnel back in 1995, so I did not want to mess around with all that mouse crap. Well, I looked up some Windows keys, and they're right there in the Windows Help. And just a few Windows keys will make you really like navigating around Windows 8. Most of us are not going to be in a touchless situation for a while. You're not going to have a computer that's got touch on it for a while, I'm assuming. If you've got a tablet, sure, but I'm talking about regular desktop, big time laptop that does serious work, you're going to be working non-touch. What I found though, and this is interesting, is that once I figured out a few key combinations, I'm sitting there doing my blogging, and I realized that an hour and a half after I'd installed Windows 8, I completely forgot I was in Windows 8. It just seemed like regular old Windows 7. I mean, everything ran. One driver didn't work. And the setup program warned me before I even installed it. It said it was a, it was a VMware thing. It said, uh, the VMware 8's a little weird. We recommend you upgrade to 9. I was like, you, what, you want me to give VMware money? I thought, that's, that was pretty impressive. I thought that was... That was no, as, as, cool as, that, as, as it turns out, uh, that particular product worked out just lovely. Okay? So... Let's understand a few key combinations. So let me just show them to you. They're right here on this screen. You don't have to make any notes, so just, you know, uh, uh, don't worry about it. So here, if I want to get to the start screen, the Windows keys, the key is going to take you right there. Um, and it's typically faster than anything else if, if you spend a lot of time on the keyboard as I do. If you want to get back to the desktop, it's the Windows key with D, D for desktop. One of the things that's a little different about the Explorer interface is the getting to Explorer in the first place. Uh, it's once one is open, if you click it again, you get the same one. It's a little harder to have a lot of Explorer windows open. You're all going to be different. Some of you are looking at me weird, like, why does he have more than one Explorer window open? What's wrong with that, man? But for me, I like to. Windows E for Explorer. And again, that's not even new, right? That's, a, that's an old thing that we've had for a long time. But it is the quickest way to get to this stuff. If you want to start hacking around with some of the tablet-y stuff, you've probably seen that there's the notion of snapping, where I can have one thing take about a third of your screen, another thing takes... Uh, two-thirds of that screen. Well, making that all work even with a touch device, at least for me, is a little wonky. So that's why I like Windows period. Windows period cycles through my options with my foreground apps. So I think that's kind of nice. Another thing, too, is when I do run a, a Metro app, a, 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 I'm not a blue badge, I can say Metro. Um, the way these apps work 
is that they're, you know, they're built for big, fat fingers. Because of that, these apps are going to have relatively more simple user interfaces. I mean, I know you know this. I want to highlight this for you. It is because of the fact that we essentially have big, fat fingers that we end up with a simpler user interface. And, and by the way, that's the case for every tablet uh, OS that exists. Android's got the same problem. iOS has the same problem. And I'm sure everybody else is going to have the same problem as well. But that leads to the following problem. The problem is I need to get to a menu. I'm used to a menu. We cl clearly can't have the same kind of menu that we're used to in Office. But there is some menuing systems. But there's some flexibility about what a developer can do. And so, for example, with some of these guys, if I swipe down, I get some options. Other cases, I've got to come over this way, go to settings, and get stuff like that. If I want to quickly find out what's available to me, Windows Z. Instead of just messing around and saying, what are my options, Windows Z is just about the fastest way to do it, as far as I can see. And I was kind of thinking you guys knew this, but I have had 10 people ask me this in the last two hours. To close this, I take my finger, press, pull down like that. Don't lift your finger up. Take it all the way down, and it's gone. Oh, but for keyboard junkies, Alt F4 still works. Yes. Yes. I like being able to reuse things I learned a long time ago, you know. Um, the, uh, the first Windows key everyone seems to learn is Windows X. That down there gives us a lot of goodies all in one place. Um, getting to the charms. Getting to these charms, they're required to get a fair number of things done. You do by sweeping in with a touch, but again, I don't have a touch on my other laptop. And so the way that I do this is I just simply do Windows C for charms. Windows I takes me to settings. And by the way, the other setting thing, another fine thing that I find that people don't, haven't figured out yet is that there are two control panels. We're slowly seeing the functionality of the control panel migrate from our old friend, the control panel, to the new one. The new one is part of Metro. And one of the part of the Windows, the other thing, anyway, um, it's, it's part of the tablet apps. And because of that, there's a phrase that Microsoft uses sometimes for utilities that are sitting in the start screen called immersive. This is the immersive control panel, OK? I don't want to do too much of this UI stuff. I just want to spend a few minutes on this because I just find that that can be really helpful to folks when I do that. And I've got some other ones there that you can take a look at at your leisure. But I think those are the ones that you'll find to be kind of useful. Um, and actually, there's a, oops. How many of you have an extra screen in addition to your laptop? I become addicted. I'm, I'm a complete baby when I don't have a second screen now. Just a, and so one of the nice things about this is that um, uh, this guy, what does that do? Oh, it's, uh, Windows page up, page down, swaps your monitors around for you. People will say, how do I get the Metro desktop on that screen? And that's, that, that's the way to do it. Um, another one, too, is if you. The problem that every tablet has is when you move it like this a little bit, sometimes it decides to go portrait. And sometimes it waits to like, do this and bang it on the table and that sort of thing. Well, and sometimes it does it too much. So almost no one seems to know that Windows O for orientation, locks orientation. And then there's the golden oldies. These things have been around forever. OK, does that make sense? OK. Um, folks, take pictures if you like. But you can download these PowerPoints. You paid for the show. You just got to go to ComNet, go back to the thing where you, where you found me, and you're going to see a link. Uh, I don't know when Channel 9 is going to have it, but it will be. I mean, this will be, I, I promise you, this is, this is not a secret, OK? I want to talk a little bit about the new apps. I want to talk a little bit about the new Metro apps, OK? So first of all, what are they called? Let's see what you guys think. So, so how many of you think they're called Metro apps, if that's the official name? OK. See, they can't be called Metro apps, because Metro was actually a cool name when Microsoft came out with that. I really liked it. But um, like the German version of Walmart, they're bigger than Microsoft, said, uh, we do not like this. We will sue you if you keep doing this. <laughs> Microsoft uh, must have thought that the Germans had a sense of humor. And, and so they did it anyway. And they said, oh, we're going to sue you. And so they, they had to stop doing it. That, that's the reason it's not Metro anymore. How about apps? Can we use the word apps? That's something that some people do. APPS, for, from, for, in some people's mouths, means a, a, what is the official word, by the way, is called the Windows Store app. So that's the official phrase. For a while, it was the Windows 8 design style applications. That one trips right off the tongue, right? So, and you'll hear immersive apps for some of them. Modern apps, that's, that's kind of the one I like best, because modern is easy to say. It's not one of those things that has a lot of you know, fricatives and plosives and all that sort of thing. Anyway, so um, I'm, I'm going to sometimes say store apps. I'm trying to, re to, to uh, retrain myself. All right. Why do you care? 
You care because I'll bet, how many of you build images, Windows images to deploy to people's systems? Really, it's not like everybody? I figure it's a lot of you. And so when I'm deploying an image, what do I want? I want the applications already sitting on the computer. All right, now understand, this is, I'm not going to spend forever on, these, on these, these modern apps, but I do want you to understand that they change the story when it comes to deployment. If you get a chance, Michael Nihas did a talk yesterday. There were only like 16 people in the room, unfortunately, because it was a great talk. And Michael talked in great detail, more time than I have, about how these things work and how you can deploy them. I'm going to give you the short version, which fortunately, I felt good about the fact that I knew 90% of what Michael said before he said it, but he, he, he cleared up some other things for me as well. Okay? Anyway, so first of all, why do we care about the tablet apps? Why do we want them? They're very sandboxed. How many of you have struggled with the idea of we want to be able to run all of our apps as regular old humans, not administrators? I know you've all done it. You've had to look at having limited user access and setting things up so your applications can be used by limited users. Is that correct? Do I have that right? OK. So Microsoft said, look, it's going to be a new generation of software. And it's just about time for a new generation of software. Because Win32, which is the platform that we think of for desktop apps, that first appeared, if I remember correctly, in 1992. We first saw it in Win32S in Windows for Workgroups 311. About 10 years to the day, Bill Gates announced a new thing called .NET in 2002. Remember that? .NET's a layer that sits on top of Win32 and makes life easier for programmers. .NET applications are as different from Win32 applications as night from day. But it didn't upset you because we didn't have to do anything. .NET came down with Windows Update or something like that. And you couldn't look at an EXE and say, oh, that's a .NET, update, that's a .NET EXE or that's a Win32 EXE. The reason we think so much about this stuff, the, the new Metro apps, is that that's a subsystem that's more in your face. But it's part of the evolution. So I'm announcing right now, by the way, that in 2022, Microsoft's going to announce, no, no, no. So <laughs> it'll be a, the dot .Metro apps or something like that. So. Um, what it's going to do, and so Microsoft had, had, was, was trying to help solve that problem of we want to be able, they want to be able to deploy applications to people's desktops where the users don't have any power. You've probably heard the phrase sandbox. Sandbox is where we build a programming subsystem so that when we build applications that live inside of it, those applications, they're, they're, they're more than a sandbox. They're like locked in. They got force fields around them. If they touch the force field, it's security to duck eight. And then we just take the app out and toss it out the airlock. And, and then when you pull it back in, and Dr. Watson does the autopsy, okay? And then a lot of old people in the room I see, okay? That's a, So that's good. Sandboxing means that when we eventually get Office for Metro, I don't know if there's going to be one. I'm not announcing anything. I don't work for Microsoft. Um, but I'm saying, when we get something like Office, when we get something like Outlook, et cetera, and when you know, seven years from now, five years from now, whatever it is, when 30% to 70% of your applications are Metro apps, you're going to know that if somebody hacks them, they can't do much. Let's be clear, though that an application that touches your data can always destroy your data. You're never going to have a security model where that's not true. What sandboxing does is it sets it up so that some imaginary future game or some imaginary future word processor or something like that can't have a bug in it, can't get trojaned, and then become dangerous. That's the whole point of it. Sound good? It, it is good except for one thing. The one thing is, wait a minute, I need control panel. I need device manager. What can device manager do that involves a lot of power? Loads drivers. You've got to have a lot of juice to load drivers. Now, I am not an expert on, on uh, WinRT. By the way, that's the name of the platform, WinRT. I'm not an expert on, the, on, the, on the, that programming platform, but I don't think it's possible to write device manager in it. So, you know, bear in mind, it's going to be probably a few more iterations. Expect a few more iterations that we have two desktops. Will we ever have just one? I don't know. But understand that that's why we've got some things are metro apps and some things are regular old desktop apps. Okay, make sense? All right, good. So, oh, the other good thing about it. This also means because these applications can't hurt anybody, anyone can install a modern app. Anyone can install a metro app. You don't have to, you don't need elevated privileges to stick the latest version of Bing News on somebody's system, okay? So, so I want to talk to you about what we can do to deploy them. And I'm, I want to warn you that it's going to be a, a little disappointing because it's, we're early in the game. 
Okay? It's going to be a, it's not, it's not as easy as injecting images into something in a Windows 7 world. Okay? But again, things, things are, things are evolving. So there's four ways that you get a store app. The first way is that you go to the Windows store. And has anybody here not loaded a Windows store app at all ever? Okay, so some of you. Uh, it's a, it's a green icon. It's the only icon you have to have, essentially, inside Metro, and it lets you get, I've got to stop saying Metro, inside the start screen, and it, it lets you get to other apps. The whole point is this. It's the so-called post-PC stuff. The notion is that you can't download a Metro app, a modern app, off my, de off my system, off of my website, and install it, just as Apple did. Microsoft's got a store, and the idea is that if I'm going to offer some game or a word processor or something, the Microsoft guys want to see a copy of it. They run some tests on it, make sure it's secure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before it's allowed on the store, even if, even if, it's, a, even if it's free. Okay, so that's, that's, um, that's a big change. That's a big C change. The other possibility is that your organization may make your own applications. You're going to build your own line of business applications. Now, how do you deliver those to the 300 people in your company? You could put it in the Windows Store. I don't know why you'd want to do that, though, because nobody wants that except you. But you could do it. No, the alternative is to do something where you sideload. And I want to explain this to you, because you've got to know that, again, I have to do this very quickly. I apologize if I had, I wish I had more hours, okay? But um, I want you to have heard these terms before you get out of here. Sideloading. Sideloading means that that violates what I just said. I actually hand you some files. Microsoft's never seen them. Microsoft doesn't bug check them. Microsoft doesn't antivirus check them. And you load them on your computer. That's called sideloading. Now, let's be clear. You're not going to go to my website and download some game and sideload it. That's not going to happen. You're going to use sideloading when you build your own line of business applications in your particular organization, and that's the way you distribute it to all your systems. Does that make sense? Now, because those are not in the Windows Store, it's possible to make your own store. So you can have a company store. And there are three ways to do that. One is you can use Windows Intune. Another one is if you have Config Manager. How many of you folks are using, um, using System Center, like Config Manager and that sort of thing? OK. All right. Um, and uh, those both bothered me because they cost money. But in CodePlex, somebody at Microsoft built your own company store. So you can download this. It is a, uh, the way you get that company store is that you go to the Microsoft store, you know, the, and I just installed it myself, and it's sitting right there. So this would let me build my own apps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there are several enabling technologies that make it relatively you know, doable to have a company store. Does that make sense so far? So Windows Store, Company Store. Questions on that so far? All right. Third possibility. Third possibility is when you build the image, you can pre-install that image. You said you can't do that, Mark. Well, it's, it's a little different than pre-installing, actually. You can do a thing called provisioning. So you have this image you're going to blast out to 1,000 machines. You can pre-install up to 24 applications, and that's called provisioning. And anybody who starts one of those computers up has that. And if you have used Windows 8, you've seen that. Because when you start up Windows 8, are there any applications? Sure. There are 15 applications that Microsoft puts in there. It's like uh, Bing Weather and Bing News and Bing Sports and Bing Maps and stuff like that. So you could provision some things. Only 24, though. And then the third possibility is a side load. A side load that you do directly with a PowerShell command. So that's your four, four approaches. So here's our big concept. The big concept is this is really different. This is different than anything you know in software, in all, almost all software in the Windows world. If I, Mark, and you, Jane, share a machine, I see my apps and you see yours, and they're not the same ones. Additionally, if I, Mark, are the administrator of Jane's machine, if I install a piece of, this is important because this is not intuitive, but this is the way it works. If I'm your administrator and I use one of these tools to install a piece of software, it goes under my account, not yours. Who's the only person who can install apps for you? You. Okay? You know, well, that sounds scary, but wait a minute. What's very different? Jane's a user, but Jane can install apps now. Oh, that's right. 
which means it becomes something very scriptable, very easy to do, and she doesn't have to stand, she doesn't have to step out of the user context, she doesn't have to become an administrator. That's an important concept. Everybody got that? Okay, good. Yeah, this is, this is head hurting time, okay? So, so how, do, how do we deploy them? We provision them, we can provision them with a command add-provisioned package. But to do that, I have to have the package. And what is the package? Well, it's, a, it's something called an AppX package. You will almost never see naked applications. But are you ready? We're all adults. I'm going to show you a naked application. This is New Orleans. You expected a little bit of fun now, didn't you? <laughs> so um, I have a naked application, and I'll tell you how I got it. I wrote it. So I learned enough Visual Studio that I could write an application and I've given it away to you guys, that's what I do for you. That's what I do for you, okay? This is um, about the lamest application in the world. But it shows us what the structure looks like. And it also shows me I forgot to load Zoom it because I'm an idiot. Uh, give me a second. I got all excited and I didn't do that. And thus, you can't see what I'm doing. There we are. All right. So I'm going to go back here and let's look at my sample app. So it starts out, and you see a folder. There's also a, there's also a manifest package. There are several manifests. Inside that, you're going to see a number of files. You're going to see, for one thing, a folder called dependencies. Sometimes you'll have an application that can't run without other applications. So for example, JavaScript essentially doesn't come with Windows. It's an installable thing. So for this to work, there's a dependency in there that installs JavaScript. Resources lets me support multiple languages. Here's the big dog. The big dog is AppX. That is actually a folder of files and other folders. But it's, and as a matter of fact, if you change its extension from AppX to zip, open it up, and you see everything. These are digitally signed apps. And as a matter of fact, there's a manifest in there. I hope this isn't boring. This excites me. But all of the files are broken down to 64K pieces. So we're down to that granularity. And there's a hash for every single one of those 64K pieces. If anything's modified, bam, app stops working. I think that's cool. Isn't that cool? It's going to be hard to infect these things. It's pretty exciting. So that's what an AppX package looks like. I built that with Visual Studio. And by the way, you could do that too. Um, if you Google how to build Metro apps with Visual, Visual Studio, you will find some examples on how to do that. So we can do this stuff in a startup script. We can give users URLs. There, there are URLs called, um, they're called deep links, which are links into the store. So our basic approach is what? We provision beforehand with add-appx package. And forgive me, I don't have the, I, I can't, I, I got one example coming up, but I can't do the details. Second, we could have uh, some kind of PowerShell command in someone's, in someone's uh, startup script. Or third, is we tell them to go to the company store or the Windows store, and we give them URLs to go there. Is that making sense? That's your approach. That's the way you're doing it, OK? Remember, this is a user-centric model rather than a machine-centric model. That's why the licensing model means, ultimately, the user almost has to touch it. I talked about AppX packages. I already covered it. That's where you can find this one, www.manassa.com slash sampleapp.zip. It is free of charge, because if I charged for it, I'd be stealing your money. So I talked about provisioning apps. I think I've covered that pretty much. To provision an app, you need its AppX package. Let me stress that. The reason that's important is, for example, if you wanted to deploy the Netflix app. Netflix has the AppX, pack, AppX package for it. The store has the AppX package for it. It will not give it to you, though. If you wanted, if you wanted to sideload Netflix, you'd have to contact Netflix and say, may we have your package? And by the way, people ask me the question, so I got 1,000 users. I've got some commercial application. I want to buy. What do I do? Contact the developer. You know, buy the license. Get their AppX. Get some kind of agreement with them. That's certainly one way to do it, OK? So that's provisioning. 
Here's some examples of provisioning uh, commands. There's the three there. With, with PowerShell commands, always remember, there's a small number of verbs, get, add, remove, and a large number of nouns. Get says, show me what we got. If I say get dash apex provision package dash online, it will show you all the, the apps that Microsoft provisioned into your Windows 8 before you bought it at the store. If you have a package, and you do, you can say add dash apex provision package dash online dash folder path, and it will install my little application. If you want to remove something, maybe you're rolling stuff out and you don't want people to have Bing sports because they'll be busy looking look at that all day. That's the way you get rid of it. So, make some sense? There's a few examples you can use to get, get, get moving with that. What about the directly installing, though, not provisional stuff? Here, I'm doing side loading. Now, side loading involves several pieces. Let's be very clear. The model is, again, a post PC model. The post PC model means we don't trust you to buy your own applications, okay? And so, it uses a store, similar to what Apple did with the, with the Apple Store. Therefore, Microsoft's not going to make it easy for you to install stuff and bypass the store. So this is a multi-level, there are several gates we've got to get through to do this, okay? First one, you need a tablet app that's an AppX. Again, download mine, use that. There's a bit in the registry, which can also be flipped by group policies, that says it's okay to sideload. That's off by default. And by the way, Windows 8, the home edition, couldn't sideload if its life depended on it. The only Windows that can sideload are Windows RT, like the Surface that you bought this, this week. Um, and I've tested that, by the way, on these. That's one of the reasons I got an RT, was to be able to prove this stuff before I actually talk to you about it. And then uh, it'll do it on Windows 8 Enterprise, and it'll do it on Windows 8 Pro as well. The apps are all signed. Certificates are no good unless you have the root. Now, let's be clear. If you're building your own applications, you already have that, that certificate in your root. If you're playing around with mine, you're going to have to put my certificate in the root. I'll show you how. Does it make sense? Are we okay so far? All right. Thank you for staying with me. Then you need to get a license. The license is where Microsoft says, it's okay, you can do this. Enterprise comes with the license. Pro doesn't. We'll talk about that in a minute. And by the way, Everybody can get a 30-day play-around-with-it license as often as you want. Then we install it with a command, add-apex package. So what's that going to look like? First of all, take my application, try it for yourself. First thing you're going to do, you're going to put my certificate in your root. Easiest way to do it, how many of you like playing around with Certificate Manager? I sure don't. You, you like that? Okay, good. All right. I'm going to disappoint you, though. Or how about CertUtil? I love CertUtil because the man who wrote CertUtil, I'm sure, is certifiably crazy. I mean, no, I'm serious. He, it does everything. I mean, I'm in total awe with that guy. However, I like import-certificate. It says point to the cert, and that's where it's going to go. Very easy. Then we have to flip a bit to allow side loading. Remember, that's a group policy or registry entry. There it is right there. So we've gone two of the four. The certificate is handled, and I flip the bit. Next, I'm going to need a license. Now, there's, a it, it, there's not a lot of documentation on the web about this. And so what's going on is this. You need to understand that in order to get this, if you have an enterprise box that's domain joined, it's already groovy. If you have an enterprise box that's not domain joined, you have software assurance, go to your license page, and there's a, you'll get a license that you can install. On Windows, uh, Windows 8 Pro, you have to buy side-loading licenses. And the way they sell them is $30 a piece in packs of 100. Uh, the story I am told is that they're trying to make it such that a weekend hacker is not going to get a hold of them and try to figure out how to break side-loading. Whether that's going to work or not, I don't know, because I think that's what, Je what God created German undergraduates for. So we'll just, you know, we'll just see. Or, Get in your system, make sure you're connected to the internet. You say show dash Windows developer license registration, and it will ask you for your live, for your Microsoft ID, and you'll get a license at that point. So what do we do? We flipped the bits, we did the certificate, we got our license. Now we got to do add dash apex package. And that looks like add dash apex package, and there's a path. And I think I have just enough time to show that to you. 
So here I am logged on as someone with essentially no power at all. And I can show you that. Oops. Now, if you don't have Windows 8, if you've never seen this picture before, I just want you to know, it's a lie. The Space Needle is not right on the water. It doesn't look like that at all. And the squiggly clouds, I've never seen those. And there's no green thing that's as high as Rainier. So this, it's a massively misleading picture. So. And I don't know who mows that lawn. It's the same guy who did Bliss. Remember Bliss on XP? Oops. So um, if I do a who am I, I'm Jane. And if we do a who am I slash groups or even uh, privileges, let's do groups. I'm not a member of anything interesting, so... So now I'm going to do that, that, that AppX package, because if I look at my, my, my apps right now, I don't have any interesting apps. If I tap enter here, it goes and thinks about it. It goes out and looks for my license. I, I installed the license, and the license is good for 30 days. I'm not connected to the internet now, so it's thinking about it. And it stopped. It didn't bark at me. So now, look, we have a new application. You see that? That's mine. You want to see it run? Don't clap. Don't, don't, not till you've seen it. You want to see it run? That's all it does. So that's, just, that's, that's all it does. But it's enough. So, all right. Go away. Make noise like a carrot. There we go. Okie dokie. So, um, I took you through that, and I know it was lengthy. The reason I did it is that I don't think you'll find that, that information on the internet anywhere. Um, this is step by steps, and you got an app you can, package you can try, right? So, what we can do from this point, I'm going to tell you a whole lot of really short, cool stuff, okay? So, let's talk about Windows 7.5. That's what I call it, okay? First of all, get storage stuff. Anybody here ever heard of a 4K native drive? Okay, let me tell you about it. The sectors on your disks, how big are they since the dawn of time? 512 bytes. 512 bytes. One of the reasons it took seven days to create the universe was that God was working with the 512 byte sectors. And so, the overhead, never mind. So, for various technological reasons, we want to be able to build drives where we pack the data closer and closer and closer, which means more data on the drive. What's the price of doing that? When you pack data closer and closer and closer, what happens? It overwrites itself. So, we add ECC, error correcting information, but the problem is that there's so much error correcting information, it's more than the data. However, when we, go from, when we go from guarding 512 bytes to guarding 4,096 bytes, there's almost no change to the overhead. So by changing our sectors to 4K, we're going to get faster drives and cheaper drives and bigger drives. That's good, isn't it? Okay. The problem is this. Your BIOSes don't understand 4K sectors. Operating systems don't understand 4K sectors. However, the, the devices you've been buying for the last year or so do. And Windows 8 is the first version of Windows that supports 4K native sectors. So you're going to see that uh, a boost of performance there. Um, uh, Windows, also, has anybody here put Windows 7 on a solid state drive? What's the first thing you're going to do? Say, don't defrag the solid state drive. You, you knew that, right? No. Oh, okay. So the thing, <laughs> the thing is, you can only write every piece of a drive so many times. So if you're gratuitously moving sectors around, on a drive that doesn't have a head that moves? Well, come on, think about that. I mean, the reason we defrag things is that we have a disk that rotates and the head can't, can't move fast enough. With a, with, a, with a solid state drive, it's the same speed to get to anywhere. So defragging makes no sense at all on a solid state drive. A, and B, it shortens its life. Um, some of the early Samsungs were dying in three months. When people, so the first thing you gotta do is, is, you're like, oh, wait a minute, note to self. So, you know, I know. If 200 people leave the room right now, I understand why. You know, so, uh. <laughs> Windows 8 is the first version of Windows that goes out and says, oh, that's an SSD. I'm not doing that. Oh, no. We're not, we're not defragging that. We're trimming that. Okay? You can now mount um, ISOs and VHDs in PowerShell and in Explorer. And I like to have a happy story in the middle of all my talks. Check disk. Check disk is an old friend, right? We know check disk. What's check disk C colon do? 
Just check C, C drive. Then there's check this C colon slash F. What does that do? Looks at everything, right? Sniffs at all those sectors and checks to make sure the internal structures are working right. And how long does it take to run? Forever. Yeah. And then there's those days where you go to reboot your server. How many of you do server admin? How many have a server admin? Okay. You reboot the server and you see this funny kind of like screen out of the corner of your eye. It's a little grayer than usual. And you notice something's counting and you're like, no, because, <laughs> because you've got a 30 second countdown because once it starts doing it, it's like, oh yeah, that 10 terabyte disk that's got the databases on it. We're running to check this now. Uh, boss, the, the database server is going to be offline for 13 hours. I hope that's, <laughs> that's okay. I want to point out that the, the HR application used to terminate me is on that, so you won't be able to, you know. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, friends, you need fear the check disk no more. And here's why. Um, check disk now does something different. Um, so now when you're doing check disk C colon slash F, you don't do that, actually. You check disk C colon slash scan. It's astounding, isn't it? Ages ago, we needed medical instruments to C colon, but right there on the screen now. And so... And so if, stick around, it gets worse. And, and so um, what it does now, check this scan, it, it like looks and looks and looks and looks. Oh, there's a little problem. I can fix that on the fly. Look, 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 look. Ooh, big problem. We've got to fix that later. And look, 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 look. Ooh, big problem. We've got to fix that later. And it keeps notes. It says, these are where the problems are. And it puts them in a file called dollar sign corrupt. You can't see it. Don't look for it. <laughs> if it's not sure, it puts it in a file called dollar sign verify. So then what happens is once that's done, the next time your system reboots, and this is true for your desktops as well as your servers, there's a little note that says, check disk, you got to run. Because like, what's been happening is that check disk in Windows 7 and earlier, check disk wakes up and says, note by the bed, got a serious problem, fix it. What? What problem? What? What problem? So check disk has to do a whole check disk slash F, which is why it takes 13 hours. New check disk doesn't do check disk slash F, does check disk slash spot fix. Check this slash spot fix says, go look in dollar sign corrupt and dollar sign verify fix just those. I actually found an old drive, installed a physical server on it, and picked it up and dropped it a few times while it was running to get bad places on the disk just to test this, see if it really works. This is what I do for you guys, okay? <laughs> and, and it was awesome. It was this cheap ass Seagate two terabyte that would have taken, I think, five hours. He just got up. And by the way, there's no countdown. It just says, I'm just doing this. The countdown has become zero. You've got to be fast to beat zero. And, and so now it just fixes it, and you're back up and running like in three minutes. So it's great stuff. Another thing, too. Have you ever looked at the permissions on a folder, and you see group, 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 and then question mark head? Question mark head with long number next to it, okay? What that means is the account you gave that, someone gave that permission to, well, somebody deleted the account. So Windows wants to look it up, it's like, there's nobody here. Put a question mark on the head. So, <laughs> what else would be, it be? Slash SD cleanup wipes the bad guys out. Uh, be sure you're attached to the domain controller before you do this, okay? <laughs> because if you're not connected to the domain controller, all the heads go question. And that's the beginning of a bad day at the office. <laughs> PowerShell has repair-volume. Yes, PowerShell, yes, 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 yes. And it does the same things, except watch out. When CheckDisk needs to dismount the C drive or the E drive or something, it warns you and it says, may I do this? Whoever wrote this PowerShell commandlet, I want to have a little conversation with a dark alley, maybe a little lead pipe, you know what I'm saying? Because um, there's no, are you sure? It's astounding. PowerShell asks me, are you sure if I'm just going to break a Nick team? For God's sake, I have to rebuild it in a second. But this is like, no, I'll just take this offline. <laughs> Do you know what happens to PowerPoint presentations when, when their drive is taken offline? You lose all of the embedded pictures and all of your slides in less than 10 milliseconds. Do you know how long it puts them back together, takes to put them back together? That's why I want to have that lead pipe conversation with that guy. So, <laughs> No, having said that, this does a great job. It's just be aware. Be aware. This is an adult tool, so to speak, okay? <laughs> if you want to find out the current status of your system, these are commands that will look at dollar sign corrupt and look at dollar sign verify. You'll notice I'm moving more quickly. It's simple stuff. 
All I'm doing is pointing you to dead simple stuff that you can understand. It's just that you didn't know it was there, okay? I'm not rushing and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any? Okay, good. Have you ever had to press F8 to do a safe boot? Have you? Have you done it recently? I mean, back when I was running 8 megahertz computers, that was okay. Computers have got a little faster. Over the years, SafeBoot F8 has become less of an admin tool and more of like a video game. You know? No one, serious, serious. In 1980, in 1980, I was the Washington, D.C. area Tempest champion. If you know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Probably still have hair, you know? So. Anyway. Um, so, the, so the, the, the answer, one answer has always been create a separate BCD entry or something like that. Uh, I think Microsoft realized that they, this was a losing game, <laughs> so they, they pretty much got rid of it. Um, what's funny, though, is that it must have been the case that in the beta, I don't remember this, but there are a million websites that say, oh, no, no, now it's Shift F8. Okay, so do you have any MVPs in the room? Anybody want to be an MVP? It's like, you know, one of the ways you become an MVP is that you answer a lot of questions, put up informative web pages and stuff like that, and most MVPs are absolutely great people. Some MVPs think, though, that the way to become informative is to copy other people's web pages without testing them. And this one concept, this shift effort, you'll find it everywhere. There is no computer on the planet, and I have tried every computer on the planet, just in case you're wondering, okay, that where shift F8 works. No, basically, you can't go to, go to safe mode anymore using that, all right? The answer, though, and by the way, how many of you bought an RT Surface device? Okay, how many of you made your recovery USB? Oh yeah, let's talk, okay? <laughs> I love my Surface, but my Surface didn't love me one day. I turned that sucker on, and you know that little Windows button that you have? Have you noticed it kind of gives you a little you know, right? It would go but nothing would happen. It would just come up and say, Surface. I'm like, I have an XP box over here. It's booting faster than you are. What's wrong? Thought it was like a command. I'm not underwater. Surface. Don't have to tell me, all right? You know? so, so I went to the Microsoft store, and they were great. Because like, I was like, I tried this, and I built the recovery. Button, and the guy's like, here, is it, did you buy it 30 days ago? Yeah. She said, here's a new one. I'm like, you didn't even check my ID. How do you know I didn't steal this? He says, it's fine. I mean, that's customer service. I like that. However, in the control panel, in control panel, um, search on recovery, and it'll tell you to create a CD or a USB stick, and it will make this recovery. And then, because if you don't have that, you can't fix your surface, okay? So please be sure to do that. What happens at that point is you, you plug the USB stick in, you turn this thing on, you hold down the power key and the volume down button. I'm not joking. Um, and you do have to tap Dixie with your, le that's okay. <laughs> and that will bring you to, into the recovery partition, okay? There's several ways to do this, okay? So. There's some really interesting stories. When I think about every new version of Windows, it always seems to me that there's one word that summarizes it. When, uh, you know, with, with XP in 2003, it was like, continue, you know, extend, keep doing what we're doing, expand upon Windows 2000. With Vista in 2008, though, it was a different story. I think it was a grimmer story. Because I'm glad I wasn't a security guy at Microsoft in the early part of the 2000s. You know, we had, we had Nimda and Code Red and Slammer and, and Blaster and all those guys. And, you know, it, just, and it just, just went on. And that's why Vista was so late. That's why Server 2008 was so late. So the one word I used to describe Vista and, and 2008, security. They were all about security. Firewalls were up. It was really, all of a sudden, it's hard to do remote administration on systems because the firewalls were up. Things have changed. Microsoft clearly thinks they've got more of a handle on it. And if you look at the number of vulnerabilities that are out there that are related to, to they may be right. That's why if you saw, I don't know if you... Follow me, I'm M. Manassi. Um, but if you follow me on Twitter, um, there was an announcement yesterday that I tweeted that PowerShell, out of the box, on server 2012 R2, its execution policy is going to be um, uh, remote signed. So that's, that's nice. I mean, this is Microsoft thinking, hey, we think we got this, this thing, you know, uh, working. So one of the things that's interesting is that there's some of the best security stuff we've ever seen is in Windows 8. And let me tell you why. A UEFI BIOS, it's a different kind of a BIOS, the short version. How many of you 
have heard of UEFI BIOSes. Everybody's heard of them, right? Do you really, how many of you really understand them? Okay, good, let me explain them. So, you know how BIOSes have like code in them, they're, they're in a chip and you can flash them. So the fear is that if a bad guy tricks you into flashing your BIOS, you now have a virus in your BIOS. When you got a virus in your BIOS, that is game over, you know, on most systems. That's called a boot kit, not a root kit. Then there's a root kit. What's a root kit? I hate the phrase root kit. Back in the DOS days, we called them stealth viruses. That was a, that was a good name for them. Basically, it's a virus that, uh, it's malware that not only installs itself, but it also installs a cloaking device so that you can't see it. Now, that cloaking device is only active. So essentially, what a boot kit does that's so scary is that it corrupts your operating system into going along with it. Thus, the cloaking only happens when what's running? Your operating system. You with me on this? Thus, if there were a way to boot Windows off a USB stick, do a cold boot off of a USB stick, that rootkit's sitting there naked and everybody can see it. So some really good news along those lines. First, a UEFI BIOS, this is the very short version. If you're a security expert, just plug your ears or you'll start screaming, okay? Essentially, built into your system by your OEM is a root certificate. That root certificate is then used to verify si signing certificates for all of your BIOS. What was a BIOS becomes a UFI driver, which essentially just means a BIOS with a digital certificate on it. Which means if somebody tries to corrupt that, it's not going to pass a certificate anymore, and your system's not going to run. That chain of certificates leads then from where? To there, to the boot record on the disk, which leads to the, all of the code in your operating system. What am I saying? I'm saying there's a chain of belief, a chain of trust, when you start your system up. It means that if you have a UEFI BIOS, and by the way, the BIOS isn't enough, you have to set it in something called secure boot mode. Windows 8 knows how to install secure boot. It's a longer story. But the idea is, look, there's no such thing as impossible. But you've got to work really, really hard to corrupt all those certificates and rehash everything. Here's what I'm saying to you. Have you had to worry about root kits? Of course you have. I don't know if you've heard of boot kits, they, they certainly would worry you. This is a class of things we've been fighting for 13 years. First time I came up, I mean, stealth DOS things a bit earlier, but, but root kits per se seem to return around 99 or 2000. By doing this, Microsoft has essentially killed off an entire strain of malware. This is like, this is like eradicating smallpox. They've essentially done that to this part of the world. That's awesome, that's great, okay? Let's be clear, there's plenty of other things. The bad guys are always getting smarter. But if you've got UFI BIOS systems and you're using secure boot, then you're, you're making great strides, okay? Another great thing. What did I say about boot kits, about root kits? Well, root kits are things that load early inside the operating system to corrupt the operating system. Windows 8 has a thing called ELAM, early launch anti-malware. There's a special new place, as early as it can possibly be in the operating system, where malware, where anti-malware software, and by the way, it's not just Microsoft's, everybody does it, Kaspersky's got it, et cetera. They've written these special pieces of code to do a scan before the operating system loads. Is it perfect? No, but it's gonna catch a whole lot of extra things. So between UFI and ELAM, things are really moving along. Does that make it sense? Questions, anybody? Oh, by the way, one thing about Secure Boot. Secure Boot's not going to let you boot off of any other systems. So booting off a USB stick will be a little difficult. And the reason is if they let you boot off something else, you'd be able to go and corrupt stuff. Now, you can go to the BIOS and turn off Secure Boot, but it's going to be an extra step. Yeah, quick, real quick. Can, can, you, can you still update your BIOS? Absolutely. In the same way that you are updating signed code in Windows all the time with Windows Update. Okay? Great question, great question, yeah. What else have we got? Defender, Microsoft has, has kept Defender from looking for viruses. It only goes after spyware, and why? Because Symantec keeps saying they're gonna sue them. This is one of those moments that I wish I were the president of Microsoft. I would say, so let me get this straight. You guys are a security company and you're gonna sue us because we're making the operating system secure. Run that by me slowly, okay? So I'm Anyway, also, I've been asking for this for years. Microsoft has a version of Defender that goes on a USB stick. What's the beauty, of, and it's free. What's the beauty of that? You think a system's been infected, you do a cold boot off of that USB stick, and I'm certain a very clever person can get around that 
but most of the baddies are going to be easily detected like that. Okay? Offline Defender is free for everybody. If you haven't downloaded it and made one of those USB sticks, you need to. Because how many of you are technical support, not only for your company, but your friends, your family, and everybody lives within 30 miles of you? Okay? <laughs> Lots of great new PowerShell stuff. Um, yes, sir. I, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, so so the, the question was, if, if you had like 25 RTs, do you need a separate one for each one of them? No, the, the, uh, the recovery stick is generic. So now, let's be clear, one for RT, one for x86. Okay. Surface Pro is x86. It's, it's, it's an i5. Yeah. Surface Pro is just a very, very small laptop. That's all. That apparently doesn't have a keyboard. And by the way, if you have a Surface, I always say something that gets me beat up and thrown out of the building by the Microsoft people. Um, you got the little touch keyboard? Yeah, throw it away. Go, get, the, uh, get the type keyboard. It's really good. It's awesome. I mean, I have done, I've, I've been done, I've done lots and lots of typing on mine, but the touch keyboard's awful. Anyway, um, first one's nice, show dash command. You say show dash command, and it turns any PowerShell command into essentially a GUI. Pops up a GUI, shows you what the parameters have to be, tells you which ones are mandatory. You push a button, run, and it just inserts it for you, and you've just learned a PowerShell command, and you've seen it work. It's terrific. It's terrific. By the way, you can have that on your XP machines as well. All you have to do is just download PowerShell 3 for Windows 7, Vista, etc. So PowerShell is inevitable. Lots of nice stuff here. Um, how many of you do a lot of disk? How many of you know disk part commands by heart? Okay. I love this part, but I hate the fact that I type this part and it's just, you know? These commandlets do this stuff immediately. Clear dash disk. Okay, read the manual before you do it, okay? <laughs> Clear dash disk does the equivalent of disk part, list disk, select disk, clean. All in one shot, okay? Initialize disk, formats things. Anybody here using bit, doing BitLocker? Why are you not using BitLocker? I am. No, I okay, am. all right, let's turn. You, you, you gotta use BitLocker. It's so easy, it just gets easier and easier. The hard part about it, not the hard part, but the annoying part is setting up the TPM chip. Get dash TPM, initialize TPM, this stuff becomes a simple little batch file. Sorry, script. Okay. Set dash partition, I like this one. Sometimes I've gotta re-letter my partitions. Like for example, um, I've got several drives that I installed into my laptop, and the E drive has to be my virtual machines and my photographs because that's, what light, that's where Lightroom and VMware want to, want to see them, you know, and they're picky. So I find out somebody else has already got E. How do I swap this stuff around? Set dash partition dash drive letter. X used to be the old drive letter. New drive letter Y. So that re-letters are for you. Nice stuff. Ever had to set up a VPN on a system? Sure. Pain in the neck, right? Click, 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 click. How about add dash VPN connection dash name to office dash server 4.3.2.1? That works. I tested it this morning. I'd never noticed. I'm like, this couldn't. Oh, wow. <laughs> Seriously. I don't want to tell you what happened for the next 15 minutes. It's just, dis it's just disgusting. <laughs> so, it's this is why you don't get invited to talk here, Mark. <laughs> this is um, if, you've, if you've ever hacked around with stuff in Active Directory, you've probably had to re-register DNS servers. So you probably know ipconfig forward slash register DNS. Well, there it is now, registered at dash DNS client. If you ever had to set a DNS client right from the command line, that guy right there. Anybody ever had to play around with the scheduled tasks with the sca task scheduler? It's not bad. It's a nice tool, but it's, it's an it's a, it's a ugly GUI. But the command line tool makes it look good, you know? PowerShell, the scheduled command tools, wonderful. Want to find out you're on a file server, how many files you got open, so if you disconnect, you're going to screw the files up, get dash SMB open file. Could you use that? Sure you could. How many of you ever had to deploy a printer? How do I do this automatically? Well, there's that group policy stuff that came with Vista. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Two commands now. Um, add dash printer driver, you got to be an admin to do that. And by the way, don't forget with PowerShell remoting, you, I could say invoke dash command put a list of a thousand machines and then say script block and that command and it gets done on the thousand machines. 
Have I caught your interest in PowerShell? <laughs> Seriously. How many of you are not going to try PowerShell at all? It's all right, you can admit it. I just want to see who's not going to be here next year. That's all. That's all. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. I'm just kidding. I didn't mean to pick on you guys. It just means that I haven't brought you into the light yet. Come into the light. Step into the light. So, um, add dash printer, users can do that. You say, get dash printer driver, shows you all the possibilities. You say, add dash printer, HP 55 or something. Done. That's how you grab print jobs. Delete them right from the command line. Have you ever built a USB stick, a bootable USB stick? Ever, ever built this for any of a million reasons? Really, you don't? They're, 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 I, I, I carry mine with me. Well, it's, it's some, oh, gosh, where is it? But um, seriously, it's a great troubleshooting tool. And they used to be a big pain in the neck to make. But if, you've ha if you haven't hacked around with the, the Windows Automated Installation Kit, which is now called the Assessment and Deployment Toolkit, then it has a tool uh, in there that will create WinPEs. Win it's like a cut-down version of Windows. You can put it on a USB stick. You can make it bootable. And it is the answer to fixing all kinds of problems. I realize that for some of you, if I say my, my, pro my computer's got a problem, you throw it in the trash and give me a no new one and image something onto it. But if you do have to do repairs on a system, being able to take the operating system offline with a bootable USB stick is wonderful. Building them used to be a pain in the neck. Now the new command, right there. Super easy. Set up WinPE. You got a USB, USB stick on the H drive. You say, make WinPE media slash UFD. The, the, uh, the F stands for uh, fixed. And then C colon backslash wherever the WinPE is, and you're done. Oh, and by the way, how many of you use Windows PE? WinPE. WinPE 4 now supports PowerShell, which is totally and completely awesome. Has anybody here ever used Steady State, Microsoft Steady State? Only a few of you? OK. Did you miss it when it was gone? Did anybody look at my steadier state? It's a free tool that I, I built with Windows 7 uh, tools. Um, but I, I, had, I had to write the, the world's ugliest batch file. I mean, it was monster. Um, it, was like, it was like building a mnemonic circuit with stone knives and bearskins. And that's obscure. And uh, the fact that I'll have PowerShell for the next version just tickles me. Now, uh, Microsoft is trying to think in terms of devices behaving like your phone. And when I say behaving like your phone, I mean that, it, like, I've got an iPhone. If my iPhone goes wonky, and it does that sometimes, I know there's bugs in Apple software. Who knew? You know? So. No, for the longest time, my only exposure to Apple software was iTunes, which may be the buggiest, most annoying piece of software I have ever used on a Windows platform, ever. Well, when you say Flash, sir, do you say that from a developer's point of view or a user's point of view? Oh, admin. OK, wait, let's not say it's buggy. Let's just say that it's poorly designed and difficult to administer, OK? That's different. I mean, I'm with you. That's a bad thing. I'm, 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 I'm with you. It's, just, it's a different kind of bad thing, OK? Can we agree? So what I do is I just press three buttons on my phone, and I whistle Dixie, and it wipes itself. It goes back to the state it was in when I got it at the AT&T store. The thought is, do that with Windows as well. Because again, what's, th what, you know, what's part of the argument Microsoft's making? Microsoft's making the argument, don't save stuff on your computer. Save it really on the cloud and cache it or something like that. I honestly don't know that I buy that yet, because I live in the middle of nowhere. I'm in the middle of nowhere, right around the H, you know? And I can gauge the IQ of the crowd by how quickly that, 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 <laughs> that, that No, and, and I'm always fascinated. Every software company does this. Because software companies are out of, like, Northern California, Seattle, New York. And they talk like you can get internet any time you want, that it's just falling off the trees, you know? That's not rain, that's bandwidth, you know? <laughs> that's, you know that's like, <laughs> Seriously, it's not, it's not just Microsoft guys. It's technology guys. I'm like, dude, dude. When the wind is blowing out of the south, I mean, I can't get internet, you know? Because so, the back bay backs up at, never mind. So, so reset, so the, the, the idea here is that there's a refresh and a reset, and one basically takes you back and uninstalls a lot of stuff. The other one makes you able to give this away to your kid. 
And you get to it from the immersive control panel under general, and you'll see refresh your PC or remove everything. Okay? And just, I wondered what they did. I mean, there's some pages at Microsoft that talked about it. You know, they, they, they explain it well. It's just, I, I want to see all the details myself. So when you do refresh, it essentially resets all your trusted stuff. So you don't lose the Metro apps. You don't lose your settings. But the Win32 apps, some of, them, you know, some of them will have to be reinstalled. But what do they do? I mean, the point here is, this is going to be all, the funny thing is, again, their heart was in the right place. Microsoft's thinking, your alternative of having to install Windows would take too long, so this refresh thing will save you time. Now, this is at the same time that they come out with a version of Windows where you can install it in 25 seconds. I mean, seriously, try this sometime. If you put the Windows Media on a USB 3 stick, because Windows now supports natively USB 3, I set up an unattended installation file for my new web server. I stuck it on a system that had USB 3 uh, uh, sockets. So I didn't have to answer any questions. I turned the thing on, and I went to like get a Diet Dr. Pepper from the refrigerator, and the logon screen had appeared in 29 seconds. I installed Server 2012 on a not fantastically fast in 29 seconds without working hard. Anyway, so, so that, that's, that's what this thing does. Um, when you go to refresh, you log on the first time, there's a little thing with the fingers showing you pointing at stuff, and that, that, that comes back. Reset takes a lot longer because reset makes you, this is interesting, I, I really like the idea of reset because, you know, how many of you have computers that when you're done with them, you sell them to other people? What do you do with the hard drives? What's that? Yeah, I heard wipe them, how? Deep, what's that? Deep band? I don't know. Oh, cool. I, you know, I was at an army base once and they said, we, 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 um, uh, we grind them. I said, you, what, you do what? They said, yeah, we have this, this thing that it's like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Paper goes, yeah, they, sh they shred them. I said, you have a thing that shreds hard drives? They said, yeah, I want to see it. Said, yes, I want to see. <laughs> and you just drop it, it goes, ah! and this little golden brown dust falls down. If you breathe that, you would die. <laughs> you would die. So this does all that for you, and you can set different levels of how many more zeros and whatever's to write, so it's, it's a pretty good deal. Here's a cute thing. Um, how many of you use roaming profiles or, or, or re redirected folders? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I love them, but the problem is I support people. That means if I log on your computer to help you, <laughs> I've just left my roaming profiles behind. Well, there's a new notion in Windows 8 that what happens is that in Windows 8, you can change roaming profiles and you can change folder redirection so that it doesn't do it everywhere. It only does it on what's called your primary PC. Now, primary sounds like there's only one, but it's not like Highlander. You can have more than one, okay? <laughs> so, so what you got to do is you have to just give Active Directory a list of machines that are your primary PC. So step one, you go in Active Directory, we're going to use uh, set-ad user, and that's how you change the computer. Those are the two commands, okay? And then once you've done that, then you go in and change these group policy settings, and there are group policy settings for roaming profiles, and there's group policy settings for folder redirection. As usual, it's folder redirection, so you've got to re reboot three times before it happens. And it works pretty well. Bear in mind, though, it's only going to work for the Windows 8 boxes. The Windows 7 boxes will still behave the way they did before. The Vista boxes will, the XP boxes, et cetera. Okay? So. I have one more command I want to show you. And it's kind of cool. So... There's a command called power config, and I love power config um, because it's bat re right? report er er right rary b r t that work nope wrong. <laughs> What's the command? Battery why? Thank heavens. Okay, and if I go to bat. This is the report I get. Look at how sexy this is. This is HTML 6. This is. <laughs> it's, don't tweet that. Do not tweet that. <laughs> my ass would be dead. So it shows me the capacity of my battery at various times. So, like, 
it's 57 at some point, and then it runs down. But what's really interesting is that what it shows me is that ever since I bought this computer in March, that uh, the value has been dropping because <laughs> where is that little sucker? There we go. Battery capacity history. It says, well, when you bought it, Mark, it had a design capacity of 62,160 mois. And those are technical mois. And now we're down to, you know, it's, like, it's, it's still tracking. But uh, I'm slowly losing the capacity. You know, the actual full charge capacity goes from like 64 down to, which is kind of cool. I thought that was kind of cool. No? So the deal is that I really hoped in this talk, come on, you can do it. There we go. I really hoped in this talk, just give me, give me, a, give me another minute, okay? okay. Um, I hope in this talk do a few things. First of all, um, we talked very, very high level about, you know, where Windows 8 fits. That's not my job. I'd get myself in a lot of trouble, so I don't want to do that, okay? Um, we talked about the new apps and some of the architecture. I wanted you to understand the architecture because it matters. You know, you're not devs, right? But, but you are engineers. You need to understand what's going on. And we talked about the deployment stuff. Is everybody feeling better about that, understanding a bit, a bit about that? And I hope that I showed you some, stu some new storage stuff, some of the new networking stuff, some new automation stuff. Have I convinced anyone to try a PowerShell command or two? If I convinced anyone, to, that, that's great. Now, one more thing, and then I'll let you go, but please. I only get to come here, because uh, you guys keep asking for me. And I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I just so appreciate it. If you haven't done it, get on my site. I do these, I do these free, free newsletters and seminars and stuff like that. But the big thing is this, you know. This is my last talk for this time around. I just want to say thank you. Remember, use, use this knowledge for good and not for evil. Bless you. Bye-bye.